Uh, thank you for, for joining us today. So this is the Pennington Historical Society's program. I'm Robert Taggart, uh, Program Director at the Pennington Historical Society Pennington Museum. These programs are a presentation of the Pennington Historical Society and the Pennington Museum and are free and open to the public. Um, so tonight uh, we have the history of Manchester. From the days of the American Revolution to the summer colony of the Victorian era, from Factory Point to the Four Season Resort, Manchester has over the And tonight, Sean Harrington will give us a sample of history from 1761 to 2021. We're really pleased that Sean could do this for us. Uh, he's the uh, curator at the Manchester Historical Society, trustee at the Vermont Folklife Center. Um, he's also on the Delwood Cemetery Association and curator of the Elwanek Country Club Library and Museum, a board of advisors for the Wilson House, Number of larger than the son, so he comes with credentials. Of course, the best thing is the most important. He's a father of two boys, so we thank Sean for taking time tonight to do this presentation for us. And I will turn it over to Sean, and I will see you folks after the presentation. Just about two and a half hours from now, Bob will be back. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. Really appreciate it, uh, Bob. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Dean at the at the museum or putting up with me, we scheduled and rescheduled and went back and forth. But uh, the first slide we're looking at is a marble tablet that used to actually sit on the median in between the Equinox Hotel and the courthouse. Very lovely tablet set at the Bicentennial in 1961. Uh, this historic crossroads born of liberty and nurtured by the freedom loving hub for wayfarers, host to generations, this pleasant land among the mountains probably one of the, my favorite lines that I've ever read about Manchester. And it's since been relocated to the foot of the, the Soldiers Memorial in front of the Congregational Church. So if you're there, you can stop by and see it. Um, this was going to be this is going to be very difficult for me when I asked when they asked me to do this, um, you know, picking what I wanted to talk about to cover 260 years. Not a tall, not a very, not a very, not a very tall order, I guess you should say, because I could talk for an hour about each slide. But uh, this is probably one of my favorite views. It was painted by Luigi Lucioni in 1939 when it was the first painting he completed when he moved to Manchester from Shelburne. Uh, you know, Luigi is obviously very well known and was a fixture here in Manchester along roadsides, you know, in front of barns and farms. And of course, at Aquanic, you know, painting those birches. But this is you know, one of my favorite favorite paintings of his what hangs at Aquanic in the Arkell Lounge. Um, and I just wanted to share it with you just because I enjoy it so much. Um, tonight's presentation, you know, we're going to cut, we're going to just touch on all of these. I'm going to talk fast. There's going to be a lot of pictures, but the beauty is it is being recorded. So you can go back and you can watch it again. And if you have more questions, you know, you can always, you know, reach out to the Historical Society. You could, you know, you can reach out to Bob, you can reach out to myself. Um, and I'm happy to expand upon until you ask me to stop. Uh, we're going to talk about the early years, uh, 1761 to 1853. We're going to talk about Franklin Orbis and the establishment of the summer colony. Of course, we have to talk about Franklin's brother, Charles, the Manchester in the mountains, which some of you may be surprised to learn when that term was coined and the factory point era and some of the industries here in Manchester. Fred Papps and Lady Orvis, and then Snow Valley, and we'll wrap it up, kind of talk a little bit about the Four Season Resort. You know, to talk about early Manchester really does, it has its roots in, in the revolution. Um, you know, the, the Council of Safety met a number of times in Manchester, either at the Weller Tavern, which is still standing, the Marsh Tavern, which is no longer standing, which is under the southern portion of today's Equinox Resort, but at Delwood Cemetery, you see I have two stones right here in the middle, and those are the, the Fighting Roberts family of Manchester. Um, John Roberts is in the circle on the top, and his son, General Christopher Roberts, on the bottom. General Christopher Roberts was actually the third man into Fort Ticonderoga in May 1775, and I've read at various points that he actually led the expedition to Fort Ticonderoga. He lived in Manchester his whole life and, and is now a permanent resident. Um, the stone to the stone to the right on my screen, Colonel William Marsh, very complicated figure. Uh, if you have a chance to read Jennifer and Wilson Brown's book, they wrote a fabulous book. 
to me to sum it up in a sound bite would be impossible. But what I can tell you is that Marsh, you know, had turned Tory at the Battle of Saratoga. Um, he owned that the namesake tavern I mentioned where the Council of Safety had met. His lands were confiscated. Um, his gravestone, however, is in, in the cemetery in East Dorset, right before the Chanticleer restaurant. And it's right on the roadside. And his stone alone is something to be something to be looked at. I mean, outside of all the Masonic insignias there, he has not only a Sons of the American Revolution badge, an SAR badge, but he also has a UE Loyalist badge. Um, you know, it's a very complicated story, whether or not Marsh turned Tory and he was negotiating with the British because Vermont wasn't quite sure which way this whole revolution was going to go. And, you know, also one of the reasons why the British didn't ransack our state, you know, what they kind of had happen over in New York, certainly in Massachusetts. But if you have a chance, please um, check out the, the Brown's book on William Marsh. It's a fabulous read. Uh, Tyler Resch gave a great, just reading Tyler's review is, is worth it. And you can find that on the museum website. So, you know, we do have, we have Green Mountain Boys and Tories and just, you know, a lot of the, in the militia, you know, throughout the 1850s. But, you know, after the revolution, we really turned into a, you know, an agricultural society, lots of farms. And, but the whole stage was being set as a destination. This is a excerpt that was from a book that was published in London in 1797. And I'll read it for you just in case your screens are small. It says, in summer, there is such an equal serenity of weather at Manchester that one has scarce the power of wishing for a change. It is neither too hot nor cold. And even in July and August, which are here the most sultry months in the year, the kind breezes which whisper among the trees and press between the mountains refresh the weary traveler and render this place, if I may venture to use such an expression, the habitation of zephyrs. Now, I've spent 47 out of my 49 summers here. I don't know if I quite go that far, but it is beautiful here. And obviously people who came here, you know, could appreciate it. You know, Manchester is a, you know, kind of a typical New England town. You know, the village, you know, was in the highlands, you know, at the foot of Mount Equinox. Uh, you know, the mills were built down in what was known in the early days as Meads Mill, later Factory Point, today Manchester Center at the West Branch. You know, all the mills were there. And then the depot, which, you know, the tracks weren't laid until 1852, and that was down in the lowlands. It was kind of swampy back then. It's still kind of swampy now. But, you know, the stage was kind of being set. You know, people really enjoyed coming here. And... When Levi Orvis died in 1849 on a trip to Philadelphia, he was a, he was a merchant and a marble man. Um, his son, Franklin, who's the dapper gentleman you see in the top hat in the middle, uh, decided to open a, a summer boarding house in his father's store. And that was the Equinox house. When you look at the Equinox today, it looks, you know, it's one big resort, but it's very two distinct buildings with two very different histories. On the left-hand side at the top of the screen, you see Vanderlip's Hotel. The Vanderlip Hotel was built basically where the Marsh Tavern had once stood. Um, it was built right around, right around 1840 by Martin Vanderlip. Um, he substantially enlarged it. This was, this was before uh, Franklin opened the Equinox House in 1853. He went into a lot of debt, and he ended up having to sell it to the Gray family in 1870, who redeemed it the Taconic Hotel. In the Taconic area, we can see in the middle slides are stereoscopes just doing the side-by-side -side comparisons. And the Grays added the second floor, um, which you can see down on the bottom, those pictures down on the bottom um, I took. And it was during the 1980s renovations that the entire hotel was kind of joined at the ground floor. When Franklin purchased the Southern Neighbor about, mm, I think it was probably about 1887, he connected it with a second floor walkway. And Union Street, which goes up between the golf course, for those of you who know Manchester, used to continue all the way up past Burnburton Seminary or Academy, as they know it today. Um, the Equinox really get, fell on the map because in 1863 and 1864, Mrs. Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd came here. Um, Robert Todd joined her for one of his trips. He was only here for a day or two before having to return to Harvard. Um, Mrs. Lincoln had made plans to come back in the summer of 1865. Um, Obviously, that never came to be because on April 15th, her, you know, her husband was assassinated. 
um, but she never came back. But Robert did, and I'll touch on that a little bit later here in the presentation. Um, you know, Franklin had a brother, Charles. The two of them did not get along very well. Uh, they did work together in the hotel business, and Charles did everything. He was a doctor, he was a dentist. And in 1856, he founded the, the Fishing Rods and Reels, and, you know, the tackle company, uh, which is still here today, the Orvis Company. And, you know, he and Franklin didn't get along. Charles was a Democrat, Franklin was a Republican. And I don't know if any of you can identify with that, but sometimes that's not a very good mixture, even in close families. Uh, Franklin was very outspoken. And this photo right here, you can see I got my highlight over here. This is Charles pointing his finger at John Stockwell, who was a third generation marble teamster. And now, as you can imagine, John could probably have picked up Charles and twisted him into a pretzel and left him on the ground, but he didn't. But it, this photo on the back of this original photo basically said this kind of encompasses Charles Orvis's attitude. He did a lot of pointing and a lot of talking. Um, and, you know, but we had fabulous fishing here. This photo next, you know, these are bat and kill browns. I'm sure there's probably some that large in the bat and kill still, but you know, this gentleman right here, his name's Charles Willard. He owned the Worthy Inn, uh, which is now Taconic. I'll talk a little bit about that. And that's AJ Gray Jr. His father is the one who opened the Taconic Hotel, the southern portion of the Equinox. And this is them posing at Albert Smith's photo studio, uh, which was right across from uh, right across from the Worthy Inn at the time. So they was probably walking down the street with their cousin. He said, "Come on in. Let me take your pictures." And we have a number of pictures like this, but this is probably my favorite because, really, who goes fishing today with a jacket and tie on. I mean, AJ's a little bit more casual here. Um, you know, Charles continued to build his business, but it was really his daughter, uh, Mary Orvis Marbury, who with her fly tying, um, you know, she wrote the, the book uh, Fly Ties and Their Uses and, you know, really made a big splash at the 1893 World's Fair and, you know, really demand for the products, you know, went um you know went through the roof um, charles had a rod shop on on union street and eventually he took over the manchester bank building which was built in uh 18 1832 right here and when the banks relocated to the center he took over and added a second floor to it and the the ladies were tying flies upstairs and you know it was right next to the equinox so you know he had a he had a very captive audience uh, I just really love this picture. And of course, some people may know this later on, it became the Johnny Appleseed bookstore in 1946. And Deary Taylor says one of his favorite moments was looking up and seeing Lady Bird Johnson uh, sifting through some books. Um, but, you know, back to Charles, you know, it was, these are the ladies that really put Orvis on the map. You know, they designed, they came up with, you know, a number of, of flies that are still in use right now. I don't have their names. But this picture taken at, um, at Smith Studios, I just love to think how many hours they spent tying flies. Um, this is a very well published photograph uh, down here on the left. This is at the Rod Shop on Union Street. Um, you know, we have uh, we have uh, Ducky Corcoran here on the right, who was, uh, you know, who actually ran the Orvis Company for a number of years. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to put this up is a fun story. Over here is uh, Phyllis Hurley. She's now Phyllis Dickey and still with us. And she told me a funny story. These these two gals here, uh, Bernice Butterfield and uh, Janice Pierce, they were two seminary students. And they just happened to be walking by when they were lining up to take a picture. And uh, they said, hey, can we be in the picture? And they said, sure, come on over and sat, <laughs> and sat down. And, you know, everybody else, you know, that's Phyllis's brother, uh, Gordon. Some of you may know Gordon Hurley and, you know, and everybody else who was you know, involved with the Orbis company. So just a fun little picture that I like to tell a story. But you know, as Orbis, you know, as things kind of began developing, golf really is, is what kind of solidified the summer colony. And George Orbis opened up a small six hole golf course behind the Equinox in 1894. And you know, it really was just kind of a teaser. And a couple of years later, he opened up the Hillside Golf Course and they had a little shack down there and it was a nine hole course and then they kept expanding it. And this photo is from 1897 up here. You can see the Congregational Church just to give you a little bit of an idea. And it's along Union Street now. 
And it was at the hillside course where, um, you know, a number of, of summer visitors from Philadelphia and New York and New Jersey, you know, James Taylor, Clarence Clark, George Thatcher, Clark Burnham, where they said, you know, we'd like to open up a private course you know, just on the road. And, you know, that's when the idea of Aquanic Country Club started coming together. And, you know, as the promotion, you know, Franklin Orvis, you know, back to, was a prolific promoter. And, you know, thankfully, we always had a lot of promotion going on with postcards. So we always had a photographer here going back to tintypes, to stereoscopes. So in Manchester, we have thousands of photographs of Manchester landscapes that were used for promotional purposes. And, you know, that really kind of got formal, you know, in 1899, it started coming together. And, you know, by 1901, they had formed the Manchester Development Association. And they coined the term Manchester in the Mountains. Um, by the 1970s, they had kind of changed that to be Manchester and the mountains. But a lot of people, when they say Manchester and the mountains, they think, oh, that was something that the Chamber of Commerce came up with. And I said, no, actually, it dates back to about 1901. And what's interesting about this, the Manchester Development Association, is when you look at the name, the members here that are all listed, you know, you have, you know, you could take the Board of Governors at Aquanic, and it almost is an overlay. And of course, they had Robert Todd Lincoln's name that they could throw up here because Robert Todd had become very interested in what was happening because Edward Isham, who's lifted right above, well, he was his law partner in Chicago. So Lincoln remembered Manchester and he would visit uh, Ormsby Hill, which was Isham's summer home. And he'd also developed a taste for golf. And as things, as this aquatic started to come together, Taconic Road was opened up to build little cottages. These are little cottages, um, still all here. And there's a little funny story that Orlin Campbell had told me about. I think he was working, when he was taking over the Baton Kill Locker, Red Hinckley was there. And he said that when he was learning from Mr. Eastman, he said, uh, take this package of meat and bring it up to the so-and-so's cottage on Taconic. And Red went up there, drove up and down and drove all the way back to the shop in the center and said, I drove up there, there's no cottages on Taconic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, you know, this, these are the early Airbnbs and, you know, they built five of them. Uh, and then later on, they kept making their way up to Conic. And, and I could tell you, if you'd like to buy the colonial here, it's on sale right now. So you could buy this now for $1.39 million, <laughs> a little more than it was when it was built in 1900. But, uh, this is the original Aquanic clubhouse. And the gentleman here teeing off is Walter J. Travis. And Walter J. Travis, his first co-design with John Duncan Dunn was Aquanic. Um, he later on in 1927 would be hired by Mary Orvis to, to uh, design the Equinox golf course. Um, and Walter is actually buried in Delwood, uh, you know, because he loved Manchester so much and he was a summer fixture here. Uh, you know, Mr. Lincoln used to sit up on this balcony up here and he had a telescope and he didn't compete, but he played all the time. And when he wasn't playing, he would watch the tournaments through his telescope. This photo was taken in 1912 and this gentleman right here to the left sitting on the bench is actually Francis Wilmette, who would win the 1914 National Amateur two years later. Um, and, you know, golf was in full swing, full promotion. This is obviously an Equinox House advertisement, you know, the center of summer golf. And it just really made Manchester just grew and grew and grew. And we had, you know, I mean, it was a, the village was, you know, the place to be, the place to be seen during the summer. And during the, uh, the winter, it was a ghost town. Um, let me see. Um, you know, and, and Robert was always here and he held court. He became president of Aquanic in 1904 and he died while still being president in 1926, you know, a very long tenure. Uh, he could be found out on the course all, you know, every day, I guess you could set your clock by him and he was allowed to cut in and play where he wanted. And as he got older, he would have his, uh, he would, he would drive on it with his car on the course. And of course he pretty much could do what he want. It's a photo taken in 1912 when, uh, when, you know, when his good friend and then President Howard Taft, who was the only sitting president actually to visit Manchester, he came through while he was campaigning. He did actually lose to Woodrow Wilson. Um, Teddy Roosevelt came through, former president. He came through in between talks that he gave in Bennington 
in Rutland, big gatherings. Here, he just pulled up in his limousine, stood up at the back, talked for about 15 minutes, sat down, and off they went. And of course, he had the bull moose campaign, and he and he and his former vice president split the ticket, and Woodrow Wilson became our president. And later on, uh, Taft came back in 1913 when he was a private citizen and spent uh, about a week here, and they played golf every day. And uh, with his with his Lincoln's favorite foursome, uh, George Thatcher's here, and Robert Janney, and yeah, George was George was the second president of Kwanek. Uh And next thing I want to talk a little bit about, which God, I could really just talk for hours. Bartlett Arkell came to Manchester. He was the the founder of the Beech Nut Packing Company in Canajoharie, New York, and. Bartlett also loved golf, and he came here to 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 watch the 1914 National Amateur, and bought a share of stock in the club, and came back here in 1919 and, and bought a house and became a member, and and really single handedly, you know, kept Aquanic itself alive during the Depression. Um, you know, during Lincoln's years, not a lot was invested in the clubhouse. You know, he spent, you know, the necessary funds to completely upgrade the entire clubhouse, the grounds. Um, you know, he built houses, three houses along Prospect Street. You know, he bought the Manchester, uh, former Manchester Fairgrounds, which is our rec park today, donated to the, the, the Manchester Rod and Gun Club, you know, enormous supporter of the arts with the Southern Vermont Artists and later the Southern Vermont Art Center. If you ever have a chance to go to the Arkell Museum in Kinnajahari, I highly recommend it. It is fabulous. Such a great collection that he has, but lots, as you can imagine, from uh, from the Southern Vermont area, uh, area because you know a lot of the artists, you know, he would buy up their paintings. Um, you know, so he spent, so 1936, he spent an, an enormous sum of money, you know, refurbishing the entire clubhouse. And at the end of the 1938 season, they closed down, sent the silver out to be polished and it burned to the ground. <laughs> it was awful. Um, and, you know, thankfully all the paintings were in storage. Uh, but, you know, as you can imagine, it was a tremendous loss, but, you know, fear not the night in 1939, they were supposed to be hosting the 25th anniversary of the 1914 national. So Bartlett went and he, you know, he basically had the new aquatic clubhouse built just in time. They were still painting the last of the trim, you know, when everybody arrived for the 25th anniversary of, of the 1914 national amateur. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why I want to talk a little bit about golf, and I am the archivist at, the, at Aquatic, so I have a little bit of an affinity for it. Fabulous history, even though I don't play. Um, see, there's a poem that was published in 1913 by Sarah Cleghorn um, called The Golf Links. The golf links lie so near the mill that almost every day the laboring children can look out and see the men at play. Um, Sarah grew up in the village. She lived in what used to be called the Pink House near Delwood Cemetery. Um, and, you know, so she saw the comings and goings and, you know, saw Aquana coming together. But she was also, uh, you know, she was also, you know, a, a so very conscious of social issues and had pulled upon earlier Manchester history with the, with the mill workers. And in, in, the, in this era, when this was written, this was a hot, you know, child labor was a hot button issue. Um, Robert Frost uh, was, you know, tremendously fond of Sarah and actually wrote in her the forward to her autobiography. And he said that, uh, you know, to a saint reformer like Sarah Cleghorn, the great importance is not to get hold of both ends, but the right end. She has to be partisan. Um, you know, and Sarah was also the um, the journalist for the Manchester Historical Society. And we had 23 volumes of her observations and photos and newspaper clippings, which is just absolutely remarkable to read all of her firsthand accounts. Um, but, you know, her talking about the mills, she was talking about, you know, earlier what was Meads Mill and later became Factory Point. And this is what Manchester Center looked like in the 1880s. These Sanborn maps, if you've looked at them before, are just fabulous. You know, we had the we had the woolen blanket mill on the on the, the, the western side of this iron bridge is our bridge that we have today where the big rotary is just for some orientation. The Colburn House is today's Northshire bookstore, you know, the Red Baptist Church. Um, you can see that this pond is still here, the mill pond next to the grist mill. 
all this, the big MS Colburn ta tannery, which when it was built, it was called the, um, was called the Clark tannery. Um, you know, this is all now our park and you can see they had bridges going across, you know, connecting one side of the, of the river to the other, which ironically they're trying to do once again, the Manchester river walk, just to go to show you, it's very hard to come up with original ideas. Everything they try to do has usually been done before. Um, but Manchester really was a factory town. Um, you know, this was the woolen mill, which, you know, produced, uh, you know, produced blankets, woolen blankets during the civil war. Um, you know, during the 1840s and the 1850s, you know, the Merino sheep, I mean, we had, you know, we were overflowing. There were more sheep in Vermont. I think there were a million sheep in Vermont in, in 1837, I think was the census, if I remember correctly. Um, and when I first saw this print, I was like, wow, where was this? And, you know, lo and behold, or I did find a photo. You look over here on the right hand side and this is the woolen mill. This is this photograph is taken on the hill up beside today's mm, Langway, Langway Chevrolet, the car dealership. The car dealership now, you can see there's a, there was just a large mill pond. So this is kind of a photograph of the map that we were just looking at. This photo was taken probably about 1870. What's really interesting is this, where my highlighter is, this is the original Meads Tavern, uh, which was one of the first homes built. Over here we have the Baptist Church, which originally had spires on it. You can see the Zion up here. Over here in the back, you can see Factory Point Cemetery and the large stack of the tannery. Uh, a few, oh, and right here, this is Mountain Goat today. And you can see the little passage is still there. Uh, this photo was taken about 15 years later. Mill Pond is still there. But now we have the Colburn House, which was named after Mason S. Colburn, who was, um, who was a very upstanding citizen in town. And, um, in the back here, you can see Estabrooks Opera House. This Estabrooks was built in 1885 and burned down in 1893. And it's today about where the Factory Point Bank building is, just to give, trying to give you a little bit of orientation. But obviously this mill pond is long gone. This one is still here. You see this bridge going across. And they really are trying to build a bridge from the Factory Point Town Green over to the other side, which would be pretty, pretty fabulous. Um, you know, the tannery, I don't know, when I was a kid, I was in Georgia and I was near a tannery and they have a horrendous smell. So I can only imagine what it would have been like to be in Manchester and, you know, from, you know, roughly around 1840 to, um, you know, to 1880 when, you know, the, the tannery is really just started to uh, fold up. And the reason why is the larger leather goods, um, you know, they, they had syndicated in the larger metropolitan areas and they really kind of crushed these smaller, smaller towns that had these, these operations. And on top of that, um, you know, hemlock was a very precious commodity used in the tanning, um, in the tanning process. And as you can imagine, after 30, 30 plus years, hemlock, was very rare in, in this valley in all the mountains that surrounded it. Um, this is taken, this photograph was taken probably about 1875 from Center Hill looking towards Mount Equinox. This is Mount Equinox in the back, but you can always use the, the landmark of the, uh, of, the, of the smokestack from the tannery. Uh, marble was also big. This is kind of just taken, they must have just gone down the hill a little bit and taken another shot because here in the foreground, you can see the marble mills. We had the marble mills, um, quite a prolific uh, marble industry, all coming from Mount Aeolus. Uh, they were brought down to Manchester. All the blocks were brought down to Manchester by Teamsters. And, you know, I have found, if not, there's not very many, but we did, for, this is actually two Teamsters at Adams Park uh, at the top of Center Hill, uh, I guess you could say Gringo Jacks would be kind of right over here where my laser pointer is. And marble really sustained Manchester for, for a number of years. Um, you know, the village obviously starting back with Levi Orvis who laid the first marble slab in front of his store in the 1840s. And, you know, we ended up, they ended up with four miles of marble sidewalk, you know, which has continued to this day. I think we're up to like six miles of sidewalk now. But, you know, things were beginning to change. And, you know, having a vill next to the village called Factory Point, they really wanted to shed that stigma. You know, when people were coming up here, oh, what's, what's, the, what's the next little 
Hamlet over. Well, it's Factory Point, you know. Well, so they changed the name in 1887 to Manchester Center, and they spelled it C-E-N-T-R-E. -E. Um, and of course, that didn't work too well, so they changed it to Center in, in 1894, and, and we've been that way ever since. And you know, the last of the tannery. This photo was actually taken by Fred Heinel in 1894, and you can see the tannery was just about gone. It was in complete ruins, and by 1905. Um, you know, it was gone. All that remained was the stack. Um, this is the back of Main Street. This is the back of the bank building, this big block. Um, you know, this is the, the mountain goat building. And, you know, that big mill pond, you know, just going back to look at our 1885 photo, the mill pond turned into a cow pasture in the 1930s, 1920s and 30s. And, uh, you know, a little bit later, became a car dealership as it is today. And where the big tannery was, it kind of just sat idle. This building that we see was the, where they used to dry the hides. Um, it became an apartment building and it was here until the mid sixties. Actually, uh, you know, a gentleman who, you know, I've gotten to know Jack, Jack Kriegis, his grandmother lived in there and he lived in there for a little while and got to hear some fun stories about that. And the stack finally was torn down in, in 1911. It was 60 feet high, had about 100,000 brick in it, and the Bellwood Cemetery Association said they'd buy all the brick. And when the, when the stack toppled, they all smashed and were unusable. <laughs> but when you walk along Riverwalk there, you can still find lots of fragments of bricks there. Um, and, you know, by 1928, you know, hey, there seems to be a theme here. You know, a car dealership was built. Uh, didn't quite look like this. This was more in the 80s. And you can see this is the Crystal Palace, uh, which is uh, across the street now along Routes 11 and 30. Ralph Lauren, the Polo building would be the next building over that you can't quite see. But, you know, this car dealership, you know, certainly had, they used to have boxing matches in the 30s and 40s here. Um, I've heard lots of, uh, I guess we'd say gay stories that I probably shouldn't, shouldn't tell because I believe this is being recorded. And I will just say, if you ever want to hear some fun stories, you can join our Facebook group and I'll show you where to look and read. Um, and today we're very lucky because, you know, we have this in, you know, when the, when the Ford dealership moved to East Dorset in 1991, you know, citizens band together and, and, you know, much to many people who decried the effort, it became the Manchester, uh, the factory point town green. And this large uh, monolith was put here mm, two years ago uh, by Orland, just to, this was dedicated to the veterans of all wars, but he had, this is a big piece of Danby marble, um, which I'll read to you in case you can't read it. It says, in loving memory of all who has served and of the men and women of this valley who gave up their lives and their dreams for this nation and for us who stand here today to remember and say thank you. Uh, so if you have a chance to come to Manchester, be sure to come to the green and um, take a moment to say thank you. Uh, before I kind of close out this little part, this old blurry picture was taken about 1900 and this building right down here, this was the BB marble mill. And you can see they had, you know, some statuary gravestones, some chunks of marble out here on the front. A little bit later on, the BB Marble Mill would become the Five Flies and later would become the Sirloin Saloon. Uh, a lot of people probably remember the Sirloin Saloon. I certainly do, certainly miss it. Um, and when the Sirloin Saloon was demolished in 2014, and the sub basement of the sub basement, as Bill Badger said, it was actually, I think it was uh, Vic Rolando, actually, is the one who was hoping there would be something under there. The further they dug, um, they found the old turbine. You know, which powered the mill in the years after the Civil War. And you can actually, if you come to Manchester and you go to River Walk, which that Manchester, the town green is up here, and you walk down along here, and you can see we have that turbine set up right next to the chase, which used to feed it, and a little history here of, of the turbine and, and the little area. So a little snapshot of today trying to honor the history. And a lot of volunteers came together, you know, putting River Walk together and making sure we could get this piece of marble and set the uh, the turbine up. So if you have a chance and, and you know, but probably perhaps the biggest marble story that we have is um, the Norcross West Company. And when Orlando Norcross won the contract to build the New York Public Library, which is on Fifth Avenue, and 34th Street, and the contract back in 1900 was 
for $2.8 million. And it, it needed to be pure white marble. So he came to Dorset. Having been in Philadelphia, he saw this white marble from the, you know, from the Prince Company buildings and he said, where'd this come from? And long story short, he ended up coming and hooking up with Spafford Holly West and they formed the Norcross West Marble Company. And they started quarrying, they needed about 500,000 cubic feet. And they started quarrying in South Dorset. And a lot of people will recognize it here, but this is our swimming quarry along Route 30 in, in Dorset. Uh, many, after a few New York Times articles and some other, it's become a very happening spot in the, uh, in the summer. But this is it really kind of at the height, 1910. Um, and, you know, the, the quarry gets a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, coverage because of its high profile, but there was a mill in Manchester, because once all the marble came out of the mill, you know, it had to go somewhere. And this is actually along Richville Road. This is the, this is probably about 1908, the mill. This is Richville Road. This is the Norcross West office, which actually was purchased by Hort, um, uh, uh, Greeley Roberts picked up, moved across the street and set back down and it's painted gray. And it's the first house on Richville Road when you turn on to Richville on the left-hand side, still there. And they never turned it around to face the road. So the back of the house faces the road. And if you stand over at Kilburn's convenience store, you would see this part of the house. Um, and today, Earth and Sea uh, is is really um, is on the, the basic site. Um, of course, you know, with 500,000 square feet, of uh, cubic feet of marble to bring, you know, they started with Teamsters. As you can imagine, they were gonna need a little bit more than Teamsters to be able to get that much marble down to Manchester and onto the main line to ship um, south for further finishing to the, um, to the final site in midtown Manhattan. And in November, 1902, um, you know, the Manchester, Dorset and Granville Railroad was was founded and, and construction started. Originally, it was really supposed to go all the way to Granville, uh, 22 miles away. I don't know whether or not, you know, they sold that idea just to say they were going to do this big project. It really only went just short of six miles. Um, and what they did was they did have passenger service. They had a uh, combine up here. They had flat cars, which they would transport the marble. And they made, you know, they made four trips a day, two in the morning, two in the afternoon. And they even built little stations. Uh, this is the Dorset station, which was near the quarry. And you can see it was, was a very modest station. And we didn't think we had any pictures of the Manchester station. And um, Bill Badger, who's been along, you know, anybody who knows, he takes, takes railroading very serious. And we were looking through some pictures. And this is a picture about 19, we figure it's probably about 1912 or so. And this is taken of, this is routes 11 and 30, okay? This building today, Ted's Barbershop is in there today. Some people, there used to be carpet carry used to be in here. Manchester Discount Beverage would be right about here. Uh, in, in, in Starbucks is right here <laughs> today. But along this line, that's the Manchester Dorset and Granville Railroad. You can see it slinking across here, railroad crossing sign. And right here, this little thing over on the side blown up, there's the Manchester station. So it sits, it sat right about where the parking lot for discount beverages and then would cross the, uh, cross the Batten Kill and go into the mill. Um, the mill at its height, it was a lot of uh, Italians, Irish, French Canadians and locals, you know, about 300 people at the height worked there um, year round, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and, you know, and the train just kept rolling back and forth this is the only picture I have of, of the md &G in Manchester. This is getting, this is the train pushing the passenger coach back to Dorset, going up into what we call the Barnumville Gulf. Um, it would have just crossed Elm Street and Spruce Street and the Factory Point Cemetery is up here on the hill. This is all wooded and there's houses here now. You'd never be able to get this shot, but that's the one picture we have of the train in town um, today. And all of this marble, this is along the tracks. This house is right at the foot of Center Hill. Again, you can see here's the uh, Factory Point Cemetery looking north to Mount Aeolus. And you can see all this marble. Now, what's interesting is it's private land, but I can't tell if you park at the at Earth and Sea um, and you just kind of go over and look in the bushes, all the marble is still piled up along. <laughs> 
along the uh, along the uh, where the rail used to go. And you know, people say to me, "Oh my God, all that marble is there." You know, how come nobody takes it? Well, you know, each of these blocks weighs anywhere from fifteen to forty tons. So it's not really anything you back your F-150 up to and throw it in the back and bring it home. They're big pieces of marble. So a lot of this, a lot of the marble that we see has been sitting right where it was laid when, uh, you know, when it was pulled out of the ground. And the same thing, you know, the swimming quarry, um, you know, we have pictures of the quarry after it was abandoned. It was Vermont Marble uh, up in Proctor. They bought up a lot of the, all the quarries that were down here, including the Norcross West. And they basically shut them in. And you know the the quarry was really abandoned by 1917. Um, you know it was actually the entire mill was raised by 1934. It was just gone. They tore the whole thing down. And you know the the, the tracks for uh, the Manchester Dorset and Granville Railroad were uh, sold for scrap in 1936. And uh, you know and that was the end of an era. Uh, Ernie West wrote a uh, wrote a a beautiful manuscript, which is at the Dorset Historical Society. And Ernie West remembered walking through the mills with his father saying, you know, millions, and, it, and at the time it was a lot, you know, millions and hundreds of thousands of dollar had been, dollars had been spent to build the infrastructure to do all this. And, you know, a mere 30 years, 36 years later, it was completely gone. And, you know, today you can still, there's a section of the Manchester, Dorset and Granville Railroad that you can walk along is our rail trail which is you know somewhat new in the last couple of years i took this picture today actually walking along a section that actually where the tracks were actually laid um, really wonderful if you have an opportunity and it wasn't just this is the new york public library being built um, it wasn't just that i mean the you know they opened up two quarries you know i mean the harvard medical school in boston temple israel memorial both in boston uh memorial continental hall the, you know the dar hall in washington dc uh with the big monolith called 13 columns that were made from one piece of marble the dorset union church and probably just about every foundation in within mm, probably 10 square miles of manchester depot that's marble blocks because you could buy a flat car of marble of marble <laughs> runoff for i think it was like 13 dollars a flat car you just had to come and get it and you know every time i go to manhattan this picture was taken about three or four years ago you know i always love to go to see the new york public library and see all the dorset white marble that all made its way through manchester in the mill and just marvel at it a lot of people think that the two lions um uh, are Dorset marble too, but they're actually pink Tennessee. So, um, you know, just to shift gears, you know, also lumber was big. Uh, this is taken from East Mountain, looking down at Cass Terrace area of of um, Richville Road, and the Rich Lumber Company purchased twelve thousand acres, about nineteen square miles. They moved here from New York in 1912, and you know they built a big lumber mill uh, right along right along Richville Road, uh, you know, and it was a, one of the largest employers at the time, you know, started, started in, in earnest in 1913. They had a, um, you know, they had a line off the Rutland that came, a little spur, so they would back, back the trains down, load up all the lumber. But, you know, one of the things, all this lumber, the, the 18 square miles, this is up at Bourne, Bourne Pond up in Lybrook Wilderness. And, you know, they had all these logs. And what was the only way they could get that much timber down off the mountain? And it was to build a railroad. And, you know, there was 16 miles of railroad. It was started in 1916. that snaked its way up through uh, Lybrook Wilderness, you know, up towards Stratton. And a lot of, a lot of the long trail in the AT and... Um, some of our trails still follow portions of it. Some of you may recognize. And you know, with a six percent grade, they had to do a switchback. Um, anybody's ever been to Lybrook Falls? The switchback. This is the upper switchback, but about halfway down towards the lower switchback, they used to have a trestle that went right across where Lybrook Falls uh, is today. And I would love someday to be able to find a picture because I have to think somebody must have taken a picture of of that shea on a trestle going in front of Lybrook Falls, but. More will always be revealed, but this is the switchback, and you see. And having walked along this, this is straight down, you know, loaded. They never had any accidents, which is astonishing. No runway cars, no no logs. Nobody ever got injured. You know, just they had they had a perfect record on on the rich. At least <laughs> that's what they recorded. If they had it, it wasn't recorded. 
And, you know, the shea would come down uh, out of the mountains, they'd drop it into the mill pond, and from the mill pond, they'd scoop it up into the back of the factory, and it would be, you know, sawn into, uh, sawn into dimensional lumber and sent off to the markets. And everything was going along smashingly, and just about the same time that they were running out of, of wood to cut, oops, mill caught on fire, 1919. Total loss, burned to the ground. A couple of years later, they... Um, the cast, the cast toy company, uh, you know, bought stumping rights and, you know, they lasted until I think 1924, then their mill burned down too. But all these buildings, all these houses on one side of the road was for all the employees. If you go down Richville Road, and you come up on the cast terrace, you know, that's the enduring legacy in this house right here. One of our board members for the historical society, uh, you know, her, her grandfather came here with his father and they settled in this house and she still lives there. And this is the only house that's not there, the boarding house, which burned down in the 1930s. Um, so that, you know, those are kind of the big areas of industry. And I'm going to kind of shift gears here for the last last few few minutes, um, because, you know, Manchester throughout it really catered to golf. And, you know, and as I said, you know, the, Manchester would be booming in the summer and then it was a ghost town in the winter. And we had fabulous winters um, and, you know, it caught somebody's attention. This is Fred Paps Jr. of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He's a grandson of uh, Captain Frederick Paps, who founded the Paps Blue Ribbon Beer Company. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Fred was an avid outdoorsman. And, you know, I don't think this picture of him ever made it to any national campaigns, but uh, this is him posing with a uh, not so fortunate fella. Uh, but Fred was an avid skier and he was committed to his love of skiing and actually he left the family business in 1933 and he and he founded Sco, uh, ski toes ski toes inc that was a tongue twister for me for some reason and this is a picture of him uh in brattleboro at, at the jump uh taking sometimes it i think it was in the late 1920s we don't have a date but we we affirmatively identified as right because he loved to do jumps, but he also just wanted to bring skiing to the masses. Now, Lady Orvis, after the crash of 1929, as you can imagine, the Equinox was really desperate to, you know, to be able to figure out what to do for all these months where nothing was going on. And, you know, Manchester itself had formed the Manchester Winter Club, the Outing Club, and had spent, you know, resources to put on a huge winter carnival and you know they, they the 1936 winter carnival you know fred paps came here you know he he was just delighted to see that there was such interest in skiing and they you know they had done a um, a ski trail from deer knoll which is just above equinox pond down the knoll and then on the little knoll behind the pavilion and you know he agreed to open up a a, a rope toe at the foot of the golf course down to what's today's batten kill lane and you know just was you know thought it was just terrific and you know they had the dog sled races during the 1936 carnival 11 miles they did and you know it was a three you know over the course of three days you know they did multiple loops and just to go to backtrack a little bit when you saw the orvis uh when i mentioned the bank building this is the bank building in relation to the equinox here you can see it's on the north end um and wouldn't be till 46 and it became Johnny Appleseed, but he did, you know, Fred opened up, this is the one, a couple of few pictures that we have taken down on Batten Kill Lane because it wasn't open for very long. This is Fred actually standing over here on the far left. Um, it wasn't much of a hill and I've walked, you know, I've gone down and, and seen where the, you know, where the, uh, the trails were or approximated where they were. You know, I did want to point out this picture because the one other gentleman that was identified in this is uh, Harvey K. Fowler, and he was a he was a graduate of Burnburton Seminary in 1935, and he was killed. Uh, he was he, he you know when World War II broke out, he enlisted in the Marines, and he was killed in the landing on Guam in the Marianas Islands in July 1944. Um, he was interned in the Marine Cemetery there on Guam, and his father, Paul, brought him back home. He's in Delwood. Uh, he was brought back in 1947, and he's half the namesake for our local VFW, the Harned Fowler VFW post. Um, so, you know, just having Harvey there in the picture, you know, with Fred just, uh, you know, I was like to be able to point that out. Um, you know, so Fred was pretty excited about Manchester was 
you know, willing to put funds in, you know, obviously the bat and kill lane rope toe wasn't very, you know, wasn't, wasn't very big. So he went to East Dorset and opened the Mount Aeolus ski area. This is right along route seven. Uh, this big barn here is now, uh, we call it the frost farm. If you've driven out of East Dorset and you look to the left, you see this big, beautiful red barn. And if you look behind the beautiful red barn, you see there's kind of an open slope going up. Well, that's where Fred had his, had his, uh, had his slope. And it was, you know, it was pretty well attended. And, but the only problem is didn't have much snow in the winters of 1937 and 38. So he started looking to higher elevations, which brought him up to Bromley and he opened up Little Bromley. Uh, little Bromley was just a little, was a, was a J rope toe at first, then later a J bar that went from, uh, went from route, I guess this would be route 11, you know, down to the bottom. And then you, then you got pulled back up. And, you know, things were going so well and he consolidated all of his other ski uh, endeavors he had in, you know, in Quebec and Wisconsin and Michigan, and he consolidated everything here in Manchester and he went all in on Manchester and was happy with the snowfall in Bromley. So he made a deal with the, um, the local family and the, and, the, and the forestry department and opened up Big Bromley. And you know, it was about 1940 when he opened up opened up the uh, the West Meadow on Big Bromley and it was so successful he just kept putting money into it and you know this is a picture of, he had a mile long J bar which opened in 1942 and you know Bromley is still you know I think we just, they just finished their 80 81st season and you know Fred when it, when I said earlier that he wanted to bring skiing to the masses and to the family you know his wife Sally and and um, and and Betsy Fowler would have been uh, <clears throat> uh, would have been Warren's, or, uh, excuse me, Harvey's mother. You know, they came up with the idea of the Junior Instructional Ski Program, JISP, and you know, to get the young ones. You know, they gave them, you know, free, you know, very low rental, free skiing. You know, one one afternoon during the school year, and that's how I learned how to ski. You know, it was through JISP. Uh, except I did it at Prospect Mountain because I went to Mount Anthony. <laughs> um, and my son, my oldest son, is actually, that's how he learned how to ski at Bromley. So, you know, just just an absolute, you know, brilliant visionary. And, you know, and, and you know, this is Louise Orvis. And, you know, Louise, after her husband George died, you know, she ran the Equinox uh, house. You know, um, he died in 1918. And, you know, she became the head of a vast enterprise. And, you know, she's the one who hired Walter J. Travis to redo the Equinox, you know, spent an enormous sum of money, opened up an airport, you know, upgraded, you know, expanded the Equinox, you know, just spent an enormous sums of money. And in the 1929 uh, stock market crash came, you know, it wiped out a lot of her, you know, her investment portfolio, and it certainly decimated the summer colony. And by 1938, um, you know, the Equinox house went bankrupt and she had lost everything. And, but, you know, Fred and this gentleman here over to the side is uh, Jack Ortlieb. You know, she really was taken care of by those people who knew what she had done. Um, you know, Jack ran just about every <laughs> lodging establishment in the Valley, you know, Bromley Inn in Peru. And, you know, he put up Mrs. Orvis there. He ran the Charles Orvis Inn for a while. He owned the Wilburton. For a while, and you know, he also ran the uh, the wild boar for for Fred, and they started the Louise Orvis Trophy, um, and it was a race that I think I don't know if it still goes, but I know it was still going well into the the 1980s, and you know, they brought her here, and um, you know, she lost everything, and she died in 1953. Um, she was staying at one of the uh, former Walker houses along River Road. Um, you know, Peggy Peggy Beck with you know Robert Todd's granddaughter. Um, you know, had put her up, but, you know, skiing, needless to say, skiing just took off. This is a picture looking towards, this is the Lord's prayer, the, the trail. And here's the Bromley lodge. And you can see all the part, boy, that must've been a thrill trying to get down to there. They, you know, people came in automobiles. There was the snow train, there were ski buses, you know, people just came en masse, you know, starting in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And, um, you know, eventually they closed Little Bromley and Little Bromley is now where we park across the street from, you know, where the big, huge parking lot is across from Bromley. That's where Little Bromley used to be. Well, some people say, well, where was Little Bromley? I don't see any hills there. So, well, they excavated it all out. But, um, you know, 
this legacy, you know, uh, Fred's legacy is still alive and doing very well. Um, you know, and later on, you know, more ski areas started to develop, you know, Snow Valley, you know, 1940, 41, uh, Paul Colesman, you know, bought up 100 or 800 acres from International Paper and, you know, a couple of his nephews, Bell from Walter Rath, they began working on developing, you know, Snow Valley. Uh, Fritz Stillman designed the, designed the, uh, <clears throat> the lodge here. This is Mount Aeolus down here in the background. And it's kind of enjoying a little bit. It closed in the 1980s, but, you know, there's some work afoot uh, of trying to revitalize it. I'm not exactly sure what they're going to do, but, you know, I can tell you there's work going on there. You know, one of the interesting points about being a summer resort, there was nothing in the winter, you know. So when people came up here to go skiing, people either stayed, you know, in boarding houses because a lot of people converted uh, you know, build bunk houses or, you know, rent out their second floor. Again, early Airbnb. <laughs> um, I know several people who remembered, you know, that their parents or their grandparents, uh, you know, had converted part of their house to take care of the people who came up to go skiing. The one hotel that was open was um, the Charles Orvison, like the Equinox was closed for the winter. You know, they ended their season in October and didn't open again until the following May. But, you know, the Raths, you know, they leased the Worthy Inn and they opened for, for the, uh, they opened for the winter. And then they would run a sh the shuttle bus, you know, up, up, the, up, the, uh, up to the mountain. You can see uh, Snow Valley, six miles away. Um, the Worthy Inn uh, was purchased by the Raths in 1948. And, you know, lots of fond memories. Unfortunately, you know, it went out of business and, you know, there was an incident with a sprinkler and the building was a total loss anyway it was torn down and now the taconic resort is there so coming going into the village so you know by the end of the you know by the 60s we you know we were really considered a, you know a four you know a four season resort town you know we had golf and skiing and hunting and fishing and uh and you know there was no shortage of trying to promote us as that destination but you know Nothing is still as lovely as this photo I just love. This is Edward Norris, who actually uh, left us. He died um, in this past year. And this is a picture of him in the 1950s with uh, Jimmy Heinel, who's still with us, uh, walking with George Heathlip's collie. They were out on this day. They were out shoveling driveways for 50 cents a piece. Made some pretty good money from, from the stories that uh, they told. And this photograph was taken for a popular uh popular mechanics and actually won a couple black and white photography awards and you know this is main street in the center and over here is the quality restaurant and there's the bank building that was built in the place of esther brooks which burned down and of course down here is the the colburn house and today's northshire bookstore but you know i just really love this photo and you know when it was said you know host of generations and you know this town still is you know there's still we have fourth and fifth generation people who live in this town you got to be careful who you say about what to whom because they either know each other or married to them or related to them somehow <laughs> still a small town um and you know this is kind of where i'm gonna wrap up you know, the quality restaurant, you know, I mean, there's a whole, obviously there's so many things that I would have loved to have talked about, but, you know, the arts alone, you know, we could have sat here. This is great, you know, War News, which was an unfinished Saturday evening post cover, uh, hung in the quality restaurant for years. You know, Mr. Comar listening to the news. Um, Norman actually gave the painting to, to the Comars. And um, it's now, actually, you can see it if you go down to, uh, to the Rockwell Museum down in Massachusetts is there in this picture of Norman with Cordelia and Mr. Colmar. Um, but I hope you were able to keep up with that. This was kind of all just really off the top of my head. I'm sure I forgot some stuff about an hour from now. I'll say, oh, I should have been, oh. But uh, I appreciate everybody. It's very strange because everybody's camera's off. So I feel like I've been sitting here talking to myself for the past hour and one minute. So with that, I will, uh, I will end. <laughs>